second part of the evening. Okay, if you can turn your attention to our canter, who will begin the evening with a musical interlude, Rudy Bromberg. Those of you who know Yiddish may recognize the song, but I'll uh, just sing this in, in, in recognition of, of today and then uh, uh, the theme of uh, Holocaust Memorial. Das ganze Städtel eingeschwungen und die Bässe finden Hoschen unsere Städtel brat. Und ihre Stadt und ihr guckt da hat so sich meine Verhältnisse hat. Und ihre Stadt und ihr guckt da so sich unsere Städtel brat. In the flames, our poor city is in flames. All we have in life is up in flames. Fire rages and stormy flashes. Streets are filled with burning ashes. Holy treasures are blasphemed without a shirt. And we stand around for her plex, trying to understand. In a confusion we stand in silence, with empty folded hands. Thank you. Um, at this time we'd like to say a uh, uh, sing for you a memorial prayer in memory of those uh, taken from us in the Holocaust. It's a Jewish custom to stand for this prayer. Can I 
اطرار میترخاییم هنیش ماتهم هدنای هون نخلتا ویان او خومه شرف رو مر میش که ماتهم و نهان Thank you for your attention. If I can uh, have your attention for a few moments, uh, my name is uh, Frank Morocco and I am the treasurer of the Law Society, which in our Society means that I'm the leader of the society, and so it's my distinct honor to extend a few words of greetings to all of you today. I wanted to say, first of all, how pleased we are uh, to be able to participate in this event uh, with the uh, League for Human Rights of the B'nai B'rith. It's so difficult as a society that has the responsibility for the legal profession in this province to find and do something that you think will be effective in combating racial hatred and all of the other negative and evil feelings which give rise to the tragedies that we remember today. It's disturbing and important to remember and protect the history of these events because the echoes of the Holocaust are still heard in Bosnia, in Rwanda, in Darfur, in Sudan. And so those of us who have the privilege of being the custodians of the legal profession in this province have an obligation to try to make our own contribution to make sure that the history of these events is protected. I want to extend my thanks to my colleagues, uh, my venture colleagues, who authored, uh, with Convocation's approval, a set of principles which are, is entitled Respect for Religious and Spiritual Beliefs, a statement of principles, and those principles are here. They were adopted unanimously by convocation, and I want to extend my thanks to Andrea Alexander, Tom Heintzman, Mark Sandler, Gary Gottlieb, and Joanne St. Louis, who is the chair, was the chair of the working group. We thought it was important to make that statement uh, to try to establish, on behalf of the profession, a statement of principles respecting religious beliefs. It's important to protect the history of what happened because, of course, as we all grow older, as the, as the clock remorselessly ticks on for all of us, uh, it's especially important that these events not be forgotten when one is confronted by people who, for the, who in many cases, for the basest reasons, would deny that these events even happened. No thinking, educated person can explain what happened to two-thirds of the Jewish people in the 21 countries occupied by the Nazis. For someone to say that these events didn't occur means that they are motivated, if they are remotely intelligent, by uh, the basis of intentions. And so it's our responsibility to protect that history. I would also like uh, to, for, to say on behalf of the Chief Justice there, to, to extend his apologies for not being able to speak. There was, a, unfortunately, a miscommunication between the Chief Justice and myself about the timing of his remarks. And today is his 48th wedding anniversary, and he didn't think it was a good idea to leave his wife sitting all by herself in a restaurant. Eventually, notwithstanding the very strong affection he has for many of the people in this room, uh, he felt that it was in his best interest to leave. 
but he did ask me and I did promise that I would explain to you that it was only that extraordinary event which caused him to depart early. I would like now to um, call upon uh, Dr. Karen Mock to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. It really is an honor and a pleasure to be here. And when the cantor's melodious sound went up in this room, I couldn't help but smile and think when the founders of the Law Society created this, I don't think they anticipated that the acoustics would be specifically for hearing a magnificent cantorial Jewish prayer. And it said to me how far we have all really come. And, <laughs> and, I, and I think neither did they realize how inclusive the committee would be that created the principles. And again, we see how far we have come. I was actually asked to be a transition from the panel to the ceremony and to kind of summarize the panel. I think there was an anticipation that there might be two almost separate audiences or most many people wouldn't have heard it, but I'm not gonna do that because I think that most of you heard the wonderful panel. So I had two little pages of notes and I'm gonna restrict it to one because I was asked to make some remarks about about parts of how it is we all need to work together not only to preserve memory and preserve history and understand that those who don't understand history and don't know history are bound to repeat it but also you know where do groups like ours the canadian race relations foundation and others come into this some of you may not be aware that the Canadian Race Relations Foundation was uh, founded as part of the National Japanese Redress Agreement. And I like to sum up what it is that we do in two words that are reserved for our community in a different way, never again. But never again in the Canadian context would there be such complete abrogation and violation of human and civil rights without people speaking up and exposing racism, even if it is in the interest of security. But also, never again would a community be left on its own without any support from other communities, because that community couldn't get any funding when they, the government was demanding that there was data and research to back up their claims. And so they built in to the agreement the creation of an independent arm's length organization. Why? To document the history of racism in this country and to work with partners. And I must say that having worked for 12 years as a national director of the League for Human Rights, that kind of grounding as they say, if you're not for your own community, who will you be for? But if you are only for yourself, as Hillel says, what am I? And if not now, when? And I think that the fact that the Law Society and the League for Human Rights of the Neighbors have come together for this very significant event with representatives of many other organizations is really something of which we all can and should be proud. I do want to comment, I was very embroiled, as many of us are these days, in strategic planning, and how are you going to do measurable outcomes for this kind of work that we do in moral education, and multiculturalism, and anti-racism. And so I was reminded of a comment that I read in, believe it or not, the newsletter of the Association for Creative Change and Organization Renewal and Development. And there's a quote right in that one on strategic planning 
and it says, people don't fail in planning, they fail in execution. What our panel showed us is that Canada hasn't failed in having the laws and planning and all of the strategies. In fact, I recently served as interlocutor with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation for the Special Rapporteur's visit to Canada, Special Rapporteur on Racism. And he told the UN that Canada has, among all the nations, probably the best legal legislative framework for the elimination of racism and all forms of racism, including, by the way, anti-Semitism. It was one of the first times that there was attention paid to anti-Semitism in the Special Rapporteur's report. And he said, we in Canada have an extensive legal legislative framework. However, what is completely inconsistent across this country is the implementation. That yes, there is the Human Rights Commission federally, but its implementation, as we heard earlier, is inconsistent. Every province, well, except British Columbia now, has a Human Rights Commission, but inconsistent application of their powers. And similarly, we see the challenge in actually implementing the law. I once coined the expression that our work is about protection, prevention, and partnership. And you have heard already about protection. But you know, and it's been said here, the law is not enough. It's protection of the law, protection, knowing who to call, knowing that they'll do something and to whom to report. Prevention through education. People spoke about education, and I think you did see the document out there that the League for Human Rights of B'nai B'rith did. Because as was said in the panel, where is the legislation that says that there needs to be Holocaust education? Well, the government federally and provincially enacted legislation for Holocaust Memorial Day with no resources for teachers. So that's why, as was mentioned by Judy, and the work of the League for Human Rights of B'nai B'rith to provide that education via the internet, I might add. Richard, you can get it online. <laughs> but who knows about it? And the recent case that many people were referring to, where the young people, oh well, they didn't know. They didn't have the education. Actually, uh, Jennifer Walcom was the prosecutor on that. She was in the audience here. And I think was kind of feeling down that uh, the hate motivation wasn't, wasn't taken into consideration at that point. But then, who is it that mentioned that John Pearson was in the audience too? And he didn't make it on Zundel the first time either. He did a spectacular job, she did a spectacular job. We've got to in in encourage through education and through the kinds of sharing of resources. And lastly, but not least, and Ruth Klein did sum that in her comments, that the partnerships exemplified by this partnership today, but partnerships between police and prosecutors and educators and the networking and the government and the experts that are provided, but usually people aren't aware and we forget that we just have to keep that going. We have to keep reminding people. I'm wondering how many people sat here and. Uh, and said, hmm, we didn't know that there were experts provided by the Attorney General. Now they'll know uh, when they want to bring a case forward that they have people to speak to. So we are hopeful. We are hopeful that it will be about protection, prevention, and partnership and not about competition, contention, and controversy. That's more what it's about when government pits one organization against another or when the police blame the Attorney General for not, and the Attorney General blame the police and then, you know, it goes on like that and then everybody blames education. So it's that kind of commitment and I think people are leaving here hopeful in that regard. And one person who has, of course, contributed extensively to the scholarly 
aspect to the ensuring that the stories are there and documented and recorded and disseminated is Alain Goldschlager. He received his degrees from the University Libre de Bruxelles and the University of Toronto in French literature. He's a professor at the University of Western Ontario where he directs the Holocaust Literature Research Institute. He was president of the Canadian Semiotic Association and is past national director of the Canada Israel Foundation for Academic Exchanges. He has published many scholarly articles and books. He will tell you about a very recent one. He's also a board member of the League for Human Rights of B'nai B'rith Canada, and I believe that's where we first met Elaine, uh, I guess it's uh, 15 years ago now. Keeping the memory alive is what motivates Elaine Goldschlager. He's been collecting the stories of Holocaust survivors for almost 20 years, after he worked as a research resource person in the trial of Ernst Zundel, a Holocaust denier. And I'm going to quote him here. You don't usually quote somebody when they're sitting right there, but it's very powerful. During the trial, I began to realize how important old testimony, testimonies were, so I began to buy them, he has said. Paying for the stories on his own, Alain boasts a collection of over 1,200 stories, some of which he says are better than the famous ones by Elie Wiesel or Primo Levi, and we are honored to have Elsa Chandler among us today, who has taken such a leadership role in telling her story as well, and will represent survivors who go through that pain every time to tell their story. Recently, Alain Goldschlager has been invited to Kigali, Rwanda to train others to analyze stories from those who survived the genocide. And while in Rwanda, he hopes to create an institution called the Center for Memory of the Genocide. He has recently created at what in what, the University of Western Ontario, the Romeo Dallaire Summer Institute for Teaching of the Holocaust and Genocide. So this is someone who is putting his theory into practice. I present you with Alain Goldschlager. Um, on December 29, 26, I'm sorry, 2004, a tsunami hit Asia, and more specifically Indonesia. The total death is over 200,000, 150 very likely in Indonesia. There are two explanations to this event. One is a complicated one, the other a very simple one. The complicated one is that tectonic plates moved, hit one another, create this huge wave which went all over. Even in the process, we learned a new word, tsunami, which I'm sure nobody here knew before December, except if he's a geologist or a surfer. <laughs> this explanation is nice, but it's very complicated, and let's face it, we barely understand it, regardless of the level of the IQ of this room. It's quite fast. There is another explanation, a lot simpler, a lot more logical. Let's look at the fact. 150,000 Muslims were killed in that event, in Indonesia mainly. This, if we look at things, and look at things with a reasonable skepticism. If the press give us an explanation, let's be suspicious. If they all say that it's a tsunami, let's be suspicious. So 
let's hesitate when everybody tells us something. This, let's go further. We know one thing, that 150,000 Muslims have been killed. Who has advantage to that? We know who, the Jews. So, well, how do we know it? Because they wrote it. We have, and Marvin introduced it nicely earlier, the protocol of the Elder of Zion, which is really a map, uh, the path, how to conquer the world. This, we know what the goal is, eliminate the enemy. We see the event, 150,000 death. The only thing that we have to find is, how did they do it? Well, a nuclear device, well located, is a very easy thing. We know that Israel has a lot of atomic bomb. They don't use it too often. So, the tsunami was created logically by a nuclear device planted by Israel at the right place at the right time. I remember, I remind you, it's the 26th of December, where everybody in the Christian world is celebrating Christmas and Boxing Day. It's busy. This explanation was expressed in Al Aham, the uh, Egyptian newspaper, on January 6th. It didn't take long. And indeed, in this system, in this example, we have exactly the same type of reasoning that the one that Holocaust deniers are using. One is to postulate that everything that is affirmed is suspicious. Thus, if the CIA or the FBI said that Kennedy was killed by one killer, quite obviously, the opposite is true, that there were several. In all instances, the opposite is there. But in this case, once again, what they do is to write history retroactively. You look at the consequence, 150,000 death Muslim, well, there were other, but who cares? You know, the Muslim are the only one who matter. This, you go backwards, because the conspiracy is so strong that it always can hide, anticipatively, its action. And we can only understand it backwards, from the effect to the cause. It's exactly what Holocaust deniers are doing when they deny the Holocaust. What is the reason? The reason is, as we know, that Jews want to control the world. It's written in the protocol, and uh, even if, as Hitler himself acknowledged, it doesn't really matter if the protocols are a forgery. They have to be true by the logic that is inside of them. And that's the, the, uh, one of the main points. So what is the logic, historical logic? Well, we have an event that we know happened, which is the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Now suddenly, we realize what Jews have been saying for centuries, which is next year in Jerusalem. So they revealed their goal. Their goal was indeed to reconquer the, the Middle East, starting by the Middle East, the rest will come. Um, so, but to do that, they had to create a guilty conscience for the world, to help them. So what did they do? They created this hoax of a killing of 
thousands and millions of Jews. They created that so they could hang that over the head of the Allies, of the Americans. And they were so good at it that not only they created the guilty conscience for the world that helped the creation of the State of Israel, but they even made Germans pay for it. Germany was designated as a martyr country, as Zundolf said repeatedly, to be used by the Jews to create Israel. Now, since Germany had been determined in 1880 at the meeting of the Grand Rabbi in the cemetery of Prague to be the victim, it had to be manipulated. It was manipulated so that uh, uh, it had to be weakened. The weakening, weakening of the, the making Germany weak took several steps. And I'm going fast here, there. You will fill up the blank. Um, one of the main elements to weak uh, Germany was World War I. World War I really drained the strength of Germany, especially at the end, and uh, it created the condition of misery in Germany after the war, which allowed the rise of the Nazi party, which was manipulated by the Jews, and especially after the Jews again, through the banks, of course, created the Great Depression, the Wall Street crash. Even Eichmann in Jerusalem went with a statement that, indeed, objectively, Hitler was an agent of the Jews because he entered in their plan of conquering the world. He didn't know uh, at the time that Israel would, was part of the plan, but that was the reasoning. This, you go back uh, histor uh, in history and you rearrange and of course pick up only the fact that fits your theory. Now, here is the way Holocaust deniers are working. What I would stress here because I think that's what is really dangerous, is the fact that you have one explanation to everything. The Jews are trying to control the world. You have one explanation which is simple. It allows to concentrate the hatred on one group. And contrary to uh, the logic, that we may have expected. This way of controlling the argument is incredibly strong. Once you are inside a conspiracy theory, every single thing falls into place in a very strong spot. And this element is exactly what is tempting a lot of people, mainly people who are paranoia around, uh, about the world that surrounds them. And so it is simple, it is clear. We know where all the events are leading and we have to react. That is their discourse. Of course, we will say, like in the case of the tsunami, but there are so many, so many documents, so many witnesses, so many elements that we can oppose. Well, yes and no. The, as Zundel will insist, but the other are following exactly the same path, is to say, what does it prove? Let's take back the case of the tsunami. Wasn't the press 
the written press, the uh, TV, the radio, were they able to fool all of you? So instead of saying it's irrelevant, we have to be fearful of the strength of the conspiracy, which is able to manipulate things so well. They control so well the press, they control so well the scientific world, that there were thousands of voices to explain on TV what was supposedly happening. So, the accumulation of proof of what any sane person will consider as proof become exactly the opposite. It proves that the conspiracy is so powerful that it can control all the aspects of the world and manipulate it. And this is extraordinarily important. During the, the Zundel trial, to come briefly on, on them, uh, Zundel trial, uh, lawyers use basically three systems to, uh, well, to question the uh, witnesses. In the most aggressive and uh, mean way, he would treat the witness as liars. He used the word several times and said, you know that it never happened, you know it, but you are lying. Now, uh, this didn't go very well with a ser several uh, witnesses, which basically refused to stand at the second trial because they have been hurt, and understandably so, so badly by that approach. The second approach, was to say, but sir, or oh ma'am, do you realize how naive you have been? You were totally manipulated by the Jewish Judeo-Masonic conspiracy. They were willing to sacrifice a few people to prove their theory. So there, Indeed, you witness who went to some camp, you should join me. You jo should join Zundel against the conspiracy who made you live through such a hardship. That was a nice twist. Obviously, no witness followed the reasoning, but it was a nice twist. The third approach was based on a syllogism, which was to say, if everybody didn't die, none die. So if they are survivor, it's quite the proof that Hitler never intended to eliminate everybody. It didn't carry the day either, but those were his argument. Um, in in those elements, and uh, I would uh, like to come back to this, Zundel and the Holocaust deniers being Buds, Forisson, Irving, I don't think have in any way any kind of historical desire any desire to correct history. The goal is not there. When I spoke of the history of uh, Israel, of course, now we know that Israel was the result of the manipulation of the world by the Jewish Judeo-Masonic conspiracy. This and we see, that, for instance, and it's quite interesting, uh, in the Protocol of the Elder of Zion, which I invite you to read because it's, it's so mild. It's a paternalistic vision 
that was so reprehens reprehensible for a Tsar police but because they invented things incredible like taxes and universal representation. Guess how unacceptable this is to the Tsar. But what is interesting in the protocol of the Elder of Zion is are the introductions. Because every time it's published, it's published with a new introduction. And every time something happens, of course, now we know better. Uh, after uh, the protocol were compulsory reading in Germany in high schools, after the war, uh, it was uh, the main publisher right after the war was Argentina. And for now about 20, 25 years, the Arab world are producing them. And uh, you can get the free copy at the Embassy of Saudi Arabia if, uh, you want, if you read Arabic. Uh, so it's very widely uh, available, even Mahmoud Abbas, the new president of the Palestinian Authority, wrote about them and uh, could be considered, he wrote in his uh, PhD thesis, and could be considered as a Holocaust denier, because he said the Holocaust was greatly exaggerating, the figures don't fit and everything that the person Ariel Sharon is talking to probably on a um, daily basis. But what I'd like, and in those introductions, what do we see? In the books after 67, oh, now we realize that the Jews didn't only want it Israel, they wanted also a large portion in the last editions that have been published in uh, Saudi Arabia, the natural size of Israel w includes Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Iraq, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. It's kind of getting fairly large. That's the first step uh, to conquer. Um, but what is really important in all of this, I think, is to see that that perspective, so the Holocaust deniers, has, is now a political issue and never and always was a political issue, not a historical one. And the political issue is very clear. If, is, if the state of Israel is established, was established on a hoax, on manipulation, quite obviously it has absolutely no legitimacy. And I would like to, point, to insist on the fact that the consequence of Holocaust deniers are very much a consequence on the political level, not on an intellectual level. And it, is, it has been perceived quite rightfully in that way by the Arab countries which are promoting the protocols and the interpretation. And Holocaust deniers like Mr. Garodi, who is a Frenchman, and Irving are regularly invited in Arab countries. Arab countries are not interested in European history, they couldn't care very much. They are very interested at delegitimizing the state of Israel. And that's why the words of people as Zumdo are to be watched. Not that we fear that they will be able to, re to change history or our perception of history, but they can be used today as a political weapon. I thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to sing two songs tonight. The first song, it's a Hasidic song, according to Jewish tradition, was um, adopted uh, by the Kalever Rebbe, one of the most famous uh, Hasidic teachers um, who lived around 300 years ago in Hungary. And the original of this song was a Hungarian folk song, and it became a very, very popular Hasidic song later on. According to the history, Jews, the Hungarian Jews, those some of the 600,000 Jews who perished in the Holocaust, um, they sang this song when they walked in the gas chambers. Oh, song. It's a song composed in the Warsaw Ghetto and sang then by the Jews who fought against the Nazis during the Second World War. This song became very popular all around the world in the Jewish communities. And it's called Anima Amin, one of the 13 principles of faith, I believe. Amen. 
I was going to ask the question, how can we conceivably understand a Holocaust survivor? How can we understand what they suffered, what they went through, what they represent? And as I listen to the chazan, perhaps it's much clearer. Shevana Beis Hamigdash the Jews who were going into the gas chambers were still singing the song, the hope, the aspiration that the Almighty will intervene and at the last moment there will be the building of the temple in Jerusalem. And Anima Min Bemunash Leima Bivya with every fiber of my being, with every essence of my soul, I believe in the coming of Messiah, in the redemption of my people. It's very hard for a non-survivor to try to pay tribute to survivors. How can you possibly really imagine people who have come back from the dead people who have walked through the living hell on earth, people who have seen the atrocity of mankind at its ultimate. How can you expect them to have a normal life? How can you expect them to come out of that hell and get married and raise children and sing again Anim Amin? and sing again about the building of the Beis HaMikdash. And that's exactly what those survivors did. Those survivors had within them the spark, the soul, of 3,000 years of the Jewish people that have gone through so many hells on earth. And I think that every survivor deserves to be honored, every single one for what they lived through and for what they did after the war to try to create a normal society without bitterness, without hate, and to bring love and tolerance into this world. We're indebted to every one of them. 
We have three tonight, but I say that every single survivor who is still with us deserves our gratitude, our thanks, our admiration, and our appreciation. The first one that we're going to recognize today is Sabina Citron. And when Zundel was deported from this country, I asked my professional staff to ensure that all the communiques pay tribute to her, because I didn't want history rewritten. I didn't want organizations to take credit. I wanted it to be recorded fully that she had the fortitude, that she fought the establishment, that she was the Kol Korev Amidbar, that voice in the wilderness in the beginning, that she raised the banner against Zundel. Child survivor of Auschwitz, she laid the first complaints with the Canada Post Corporation against uh, Zundel. She lobbied to have criminal charges brought against him. With every fiber of her being, she fought, even, even when the Jewish establishment was not supportive of her. So to her, we owe our debt of gratitude. And she is now in Eretz HaKodesh, in Israel, and she's asked that one of our community leaders accept the honor on her behalf. Larry Zeifman, please come forward. Thank you. First of all, let me express what an honor it is for me to be here representing Sabina Citron. I have revered and respected Sabina for some 30 years, although I've only had the honor of knowing her for the past 10. Sabina is the ultimate activist, taking action when no one else will, and not relenting until victory or until others are finally ready to take over the fight to her satisfaction. Further, unlike other activists, Sabina shuns public attention. May she continue to be the role model to today's and tomorrow's young activists until 120 years that she was to this young activist 25, 30 years ago. I am pleased to announce that Sabina is completing a book on her thoughts, and I hope that with your help, with our help, that book will find its rightful place among our key guides to conducting communal life in the 21st century. Allow me to deliver a few of Sabina's thoughts on tonight's program on her behalf. Sabina wishes to thank all those concerned for the recognition of her work and the many years of struggle against racism and Nazi hate propaganda by the Canadian Holocaust Remembrance Association. The struggle was primarily for recognition of the fact that centuries-old anti-Semitism and Nazi hate propaganda inevitably led to the Holocaust. Her struggle was for equal, equal, for equal rights for the Jewish people and for the recognition of the corrosive effect that anti-Semitic hate propaganda has on society at large. In the after aftermath of the Holocaust, society is obliged to recognize that fact. Canadian hate propaganda legislation embedded in the Canadian Criminal Code was based on the UN Genocide Convention of 1948 in recognition that hate propaganda and incitement to hatred and violence led to the Holocaust. What Sabina and the Canadian Holocaust Remembrance Association sought was that these hate propaganda provisions be utilized as they were intended to battle hate propaganda. In that, she views the effort as a failure, but not for lack of persistence. Today, we are witnessing a massive hate propaganda campaign throughout Europe and the Middle East, this time not only against the Jewish people, but against the Jewish state as well. This propaganda is a mixture of Nazi-type propaganda and Arab-Muslim propaganda, 
which once again seeks the very annihilation of the Jewish people. The world once again practices willful blindness and in a turn-speak kind of way blames Israel for all of the world's problems. The world chooses to forget that in several wars of aggression against Israel, the Arab states promised each time to wipe out the Jewish people and the Jewish state from the face of the earth. And we are the racists, we are the Nazis, but that's exactly how hate propaganda works. And that is exactly why it is so important to fight it. It is this propaganda that gives birth to terrorist hoodlums. Much as terrorism's apologists may suggest that it is, terrorism is not rooted in poverty. We have seen enough ample examples of terrorists who come from privileged homes. Unfortunately, people don't grasp the danger they are facing until it is too late. The struggle against hate propaganda, incitement to hatred and violence must become a priority for society, not only for the sake of the Jewish people, but for society at large. We can only pray that society comes to this realization soon. Thank you. Tonight we're also honoring a family, but it's with sadness that I have to tell you that the family is sitting Shiva at this very moment. The Felbert family in Toronto, Saul and Toby Felbert are at this moment at home with their extended family. They too have the history, but they too are the survivors, child, children survivors. And they too came to this country without that hate, without that malice, and started afresh, and they built industry, and they gave charitable, terribly to so many causes, educational causes, Jewish causes, hospitals, endowing chairs. It's an example of how the Jewish people continue to survive and to give. In absentia, we're going to ask Ruth Klein, the director of the League for Human Rights, to accept the plaque on their behalf. Our last honoree, precious honoree, devoted community leader, educator, she made it her mission to teach, to develop curriculum, and to let there be a difference and to bring a light. Plashov, Lvov, all names, the husband from Auschwitz and Buchenwald. And you know, we say those words today, Buchenwald and Auschwitz, Blinka, Majdanek, as if it's Disneyland, just places to visit. Yet these people, these people lived through the worst that was possible in the world. And yet they rose, they came out from human skeletons, but with a soul with a spark of divinity, they have made a difference. Elsa Chandler, you helped to change the world. Please come forward. So you could see me. <laughs> now, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> You've had a long afternoon. 
a very strenuous afternoon for many of us. Uh, it was also a very enlightening afternoon for myself because I felt more hopeful today after hearing from some of the legal counsels that have dealt with some of the crimes. I'm honored to be here today and to receive this award. Uh, I feel badly that the other honorees are not here. They certainly are most deserving. But I think, like it was said before, I think I would like to receive this honor on behalf of all Holocaust survivors. Uh, it's, it's a difficult time for us. I know you've had a long day, and I'd like to take this opportunity to say just a few words. I will try to be very, very brief. Many of the people that were here this afternoon, many of the lawyers that I know, some of the lawyers who are children of survivors that I have seen here and said hello to, have left because they have families to attend to and have lead busy lives. But those of you here, many, have heard the horror stories of our lives, the ghetto, the concentration camp experiences you're all familiar with, the unbelievable, an unimaginable and inhuman treatment that we went through, you're also familiar with. But we ourselves, on a day-to-day -day basis, cannot believe that we have lived through these horrors. It's just something that one can't fathom, that one could have lived through and still come through a human being. Most of us, as you have heard, were children. When the war broke out, I was eight years old. When the war ended, I was 13. We came to this country without parents, without families, without aunts, without siblings. And it was something that was very difficult to live with. Our children did not have grandparents. They did not have uncles. They did not have aunts. They did not have extended families like most people have. They did not have the support, the advice. They did not have, we did not have anyone to babysit for our children. We did not have financial support. And for that matter, like this particular week where it's just before Passover, I didn't have anyone with whom I could share recipes for Passover, with whom I could discuss how to make a Seder. All these things were non-existent. And on top of it, I did not have any family history. It was blank. I came here at 13, the war started at eight, and there was nothing. It was blank. It was a blank sheet of paper. What is unbelievable is that we have risen from the lowest human state and managed to live productive lives, reasonably well adjusted. I can't say we are 100% well adjusted, but then I don't know if anyone is. But we are certainly lacking, and we feel the lack. But for the most part, we have made tremendous contribution to this country, to this community. And for this, I take particular pride. And I take pride in my fellow Holocaust survivors who, without any governmental help and without, many, without any community help, have managed to make it on their own. And for this, I think we deserve a lot of credit, or we should give ourselves the credit, because no one else will give it to us. Since Blaybris is a co-sponsor of this event, I want to let you know that my husband, Howard, is one of the founding members of Yorkville Lodge of Blaybris, which is a, lo a lodge made up of Holocaust survivors. They started uh, becoming involved 
quite a number of years ago when they were still very, very young and new to Canada and barely made a living. And now they support many organizations. They're one of the largest fundraisers for, from the, of their chapter and they, they support many worthwhile activities. We are fortunate to be citizens of a wonderful country, yet we continually worry about the world's inhumanity to people and the many catastrophes that are happening all around the world, as well as the resurgence of anti-Semitism here in Canada as well as worldwide. This being a joint function with the Law Society, and I'm pleased that it is a joint function because it's very important for us to have the legal system uh, on our side and to have the legal system realize to what extent they have to fight and control some of the hatred that's being spewed. And lately, maybe because my grandchildren are spending more time on the, on the internet, I worry tremendously about some of the things that are going on on the internet. So I was very pleased to hear some of the cautions that exist, hopefully. I have to admit that many survivors are frustrated with the legal system. We are not happy with the inaction that has taken place, at least until now, with the hate mongers and those guilty of war atrocities. And particularly, as one member of the Canadian Jewish Congress, as well as Bnei Bres, I have heard the word zundel now for, I think, as close as uh, since the time that Sabina became involved. And, and it's just, just amazing how long it took you to get them out of this country and at what cost to the taxpayers. It is our hope that with the new Canada's action plan against racism, the assistance that you can have, and I'm speaking to the few lawyers that are in the room now, most of you have left, that by working with the human rights groups who know how to deal with sensitive issues, you already have heard of the work that's being done by my husband's lodge and by Bnei Bris, and, the Canadian, as well as the Canadian Jewish Congress, of whom I have been a part for many years, as well as the myriad of existing legislation that exists on the books already to assist you to deal with some of the discrimination, hate, racism, and hate-inflicted violence. It is my hope that you will all join together, the police department, the legal department, everyone, and you will not just, just take it upon yourself to have one group dealing because you need, I believe, all the help you can get to deal with some of these things so that we should live in a better and safer country and make it safer for our children and grandchildren. I wish you all the best in all your endeavors. I know it's not easy, but unfortunately, we are hearing more and more things that we would like not to hear. Thank you. honor now to thank our keynote speaker today. You've heard of his accomplishments, you've heard of his commitment, you've heard of his uh, desire to preserve history, and indeed we are all indebted to you, Alain, our friend, member of our league, and a person who truly cares. Thank you so much.
To Elsa, I want to say, you can rest assured one thing, that we in B'nai B'rith will not be silent, as there was a silence in this country when you and the others were overseas interned. B'nai B'rith will never be silent. You can also rest assured that no matter what government is in office, we will ask for the political will to bring the hate mongers to trial and justice. We will not rest. And we will work with those that are really concerned and really committed to chasing after those today that torment, that harass, that harangue children in the schools, that bring anti-Semitism in this country into every facet of our lives. We give you our commitment. That at the end of the day, we will fight and your cause will be just. Thank you. All of this could not have been done without the Law Society. Otherwise, we would be talking to ourselves, which we sometimes have a tendency to do in our community. We do it so effectively. <laughs> so we want to express our sincere thanks because I hope that today we have awakened new interest and perhaps a new, some new champions to fight with us in the cause against bigotry, racism, and anti-Semitism. And thank you so much for your personal support. I accept this on behalf of the Law Society of Upper Canada, the benchers of the Law Society, and the 36,000 members of the legal profession. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for coming.